When I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him, and the son of man that you visit him? And so this is really the um, David pondering the, the goodness of God, the greatness of God as he is watching over the sheep there on the, on the mountainside or the hillsides and looking up at the stars and seeing the beautiful uh, canopy that God has prepared. I, I read it from the Message Bible this morning, and, and I really loved it. It said, God, brilliant Lord, yours is a household name. Nursing infants gurgle courses about you. Toddlers shout the songs that drown out enemy talk and silence atheist babble. And then he says, I look up at your macro skies, dark and enormous, and then I love this imagery. It says, your handmade sky jewelry, moon and stars mounted in their settings. And then I look at my micro self and I wonder, why do you bother with us? Why take a second look? Why? And I don't know about you, but sometimes I think that we can, uh, we can be that way when it comes to our relationship with the Lord. And, you know, we see how great God is and how good God is, and then we just wonder, why is he even concerned about us? And part of the relationship that God wants us to have with him is the realization that he loves each and every one of us so much. He's passionate about us. It's not just that we are looking at him and seeing how great and good he is and he, we want to just press into him to get to know him more. He wants us. He wants us more than we want him. And so when it comes to worship, I just want us to respond to his uh, reaching out to us. And so we're just responding back to him in worship. This morning... Uh, our band is on vacation. <laughs> Every one of them, uh, just about. I have Jess and I have Mary Lou. Just the two of us. The rest of them are all out this week. And uh, I was going to ask my son and my daughter-in-law to play with us. And then I found out that uh, somebody where he worked had the COVID vi virus. And so he was exposed to it. And he's in quarantine. So, you know, it's just one of those things where um, it's just us. So it kind of takes me back a few years when I first started leading worship. It was Debbie and myself, and uh, I gained a piano player and a, and a different, different woman up here. That don't mean anything, believe me. But we're here to worship the Lord. We're here to respond back to the one that loved us so much that he sent his son to die on the cross for us so that we could experience a relationship with him. So, Father, we just come to you today, and we just thank you for who you are. And, God, I don't understand it. When you look at us, we can look at ourselves and see our failures and see our shortcomings. But you love us anyway. And, God, we are so grateful for that. And so we want to love you back more than we ever have before. And so I just pray, God, that you'll help us as we worship today. Just help us just reveal even more how much you love us. Let us each experience your kiss today. Let us experience your hug today. Let us experience your presence today in a, in a new, fresh way. And I thank you, God, for that. So are you ready to worship this morning? Yeah. Sing loud so we can hear you. The highest king would welcome me. I was lost, but he brought me in his love for me. Oh, his love for me. Who oh, the sun sets free, oh, is free. I was a slave to sin, Jesus died for me. Yes, he died for me. Who the sun sets free, oh, is free indeed. I'm a child of God, yes, I am. Yeah. 
sing, I am chosen. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. I am chosen, not forsaken. I am who you say I am. You are for me, not against me. I am who you say I am. Come on, sing it. I am chosen.
there is no one like you, Lord, you, Lord. There is no one like you, Lord, you, Lord. There is no one like you, Every time we need you, we're met by love. We can lift our hands to heaven and full of faith. Cause every time we worship, we see your face. We can run straight into your arms unafraid. Cause every time we need you, we're met by love. We can lift our hands to heaven full of faith Cause every time we worship we see your faith We see your faith We see your faith See your faith your face there is no one like you Lord you Lord there is no one like you Lord you Lord there is no You're more real than the ground I'm standing on. You're more real than the wind in my love. Your thoughts define me. You're inside me, you're my reality. Abba, I belong to you. I 
above I belong to Closer than the skin on my bones. Closer than the song on my tongue. Your thoughts define me. You're inside me, you're my reality. Abba, I belong to you. Abba, My prodigal room. You came running with a ring and a robe. Grace is the collision on the way back home. With the arms of the Father, you won't let go. the prodigal son gives us the picture of the son that strayed away left the father's house but it says that the father was looking for him and when the son came back the father ran to greet him and kissed him just shows us the heart and the passion of the father for each one of us He's looking for us. He loves it when we worship because He gets to fellowship with us. Many of us have tried other things, but Jesus is the way for us. In the arms of the Father is what we long for.
scripture says that we can come into his presence and we say Abba which is the most affectionate name for father it's like us saying daddy so let's just respond to him this morning Abba I belong to Come on, sing that to him. I belong, I belong to you. I belong, I belong to you. You came. You came running down my prodigal home. You came running with a ring and a rose. Grace is the collision on the way back home. With the arms of a father, you won't let go. I belong to you. I belong. I belong to you. I belong to you. Just pray that each one of us this morning just feels the arms of the Father around us. singing that it, the Lord just was impressing on my heart you can actually can you just keep playing that please um I was blessed I have a daddy <laughs> and this is actually my favorite song that he sings um but the Lord was just speaking to me that there there may be someone here maybe somebody watching that doesn't understand what it is to have a daddy they have a father see a father you know helps create life a father sometimes can be seen as only that and sometimes can only be seen as someone that that brings judgment when you do something wrong whose love is a, is conditional but with um with a daddy a daddy plays with you a daddy hugs you a daddy kisses your boo-boos when you're hurt a daddy scoops you up when you're crying a daddy has an unconditional love that pours out even when you mess up. He picks you up, he dries your tears, he dusts you off, and he sets you back on the right path and reminds you of who you are. He doesn't continually scold you and bring it up over and over and over again for the rest of your life. So I'm going to ask you to do, and if you're watching from home, you can follow along ask you to do a little prophetic activation here and and maybe you want to do what I was doing over there I was literally singing daddy I belong to you and you know because sometimes just the Abba you know sometimes you need to go back to a word that's familiar with you for it to set in but I want you to close your eyes 
And when we sing that part where it says, you know, grace is a collision on the way back home, you know, you've run into the arms of the Father, I want you to wrap, and I know it sounds silly, but I want you to wrap yourself in a hug. With your eyes closed, everybody's eyes will be closed, so, you know, you don't have to worry about looking silly. But wrap yourself in that hug and let any of those so-called daddy issues go. See, we like to call things daddy issues, and I believe that's a, that's a, that's a thing from the enemy because it's really not a daddy issue. It's, a, it's a, a misrepresentation of the father issue, the father heart of God. Fathers are to represent the father heart of God. And so I just want you to let those things go. Just call out to your daddy. Tell him you belong to him. Let him heal all those areas, those wounds, maybe from times when you when you messed up and you ran to your dad for help and you didn't get that kind of res- that kind of response. You didn't get that loving, unconditional, let me remind you who you are, let me dry your tears kind of response. So I just want you to close your eyes right now and just wrap yourself in your arms. Feel that hug of the Father. Feel that hug of the Father. Let those things go. If you're seeing things in your mind, if you're seeing um, memories, just ask God what he wants to show you in that memory right now. Holy Spirit, what is it that you want to show us in those memories? What is the truth? What is your word? What is your love in that memory? And just let it go. And then I just want you to breathe in and exhale it all out. Just let it go as an act of faith. Let Daddy embrace you. Let him hold you. Let him kiss you. Let him tell you it's going to be okay. Everything's going to be okay. Let him tell you he's proud of you. Let him tell you he delights in you. He rejoices over you. He wants to sing. He wants to dance with you. He wants to laugh with you. That's a Daddy. He's a good, good Daddy. close to you never let me go I lay it all down again to hear you say that I'm your friend you are my desire No one else will do Cause nothing else could take away To feel the warmth of your embrace Help me find the way Bring me back to you You're all I want You're all I've ever needed You're all I want Help me know you are me Draw me close to you Never let me go I lay it all down again To hear you say that I'm your friend You are my desire Cause 
Cause nothing else could take your place To feel the warmth of your embrace To help me find the way Bring me back to you You're all seated. I love how the Holy Spirit orchestrates the service. Katie and I really haven't talked all week. Um, they were over the house Monday, but that was just a fun swimming in the pool day. And uh, so I just love how the Holy Spirit can always orchestrate ministry. Amen. So I don't know who all that was for here in the church or at home, but I know that there's power in the spirit of the living God, and there's no distance. So even though you can't be right here with us or you chose not to be this morning or you're traveling, however, that still can minister to you. Amen? God's so good. This morning, I want to wish somebody a very happy birthday. Can Miss Lynn, can you just stand up? Today, she is 90 years, or Tuesday, Tuesday, she is 90 years young. So we just want, as her church family, and those of you at home, I know you're cheering her on too. She's been a church mom to all of us. Thank you, Dee, for sharing your mom and Doug and she has been uh, just a blessing to all of us, and she sure doesn't act her age, that's for sure. I think she should have switched yesterday. A couple, a few of us got together, and we had a little luncheon uh, at a restaurant, and, you know, they're very limited space, and so they brought her out at birthday and had the candle 90 on it. I think we should have flipped that one over to 60, because she acts a little more <laughs> like that than she does 90. But we just want to wish her a happy birthday. Cause, so could we, I don't do this for all the time, all the birthdays. It got to be a little too much with everybody because every week it was, and I didn't want to miss anybody. But 90, you get cheered on here at 90. That's awesome. So we want to sing happy birthday. Let's stand up and just sing to her, okay? You know, I, Lynn has done just about anything you can think of. Yep. I mean, she's flown a plane, she's done all this kind of stuff. <laughs> and last night I found out that she played golf. <laughs> Watch, so Lynn, he's going to have song. you out there. <laughs> Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Lynn. Happy birthday to you. Many more. You can be seated. 
We wanted to have a nice big bang. I told her she even made the social calendar of VFF at the be beginning of the year in January at our planning meeting. We wanted to have a nice, you know, after church gathering for her celebration and didn't pan out like a lot of things in 2020, but that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. So Dee's down here with her this week, Dee and Doug, and um, they're just, you know, gonna have a good time and, and we're always here. We have a good time with her every week. <laughs> okay, um, let's receive our tithes and offerings this morning. Again, want to thank you for your giving and trusting in God. How many of you today, the, I, I, the, the main things I just thank the Lord for all the time is we have food on our table, clothes on our back, shoes on our feet, and that God has provided a way for us to make a, a living. Amen? How many of you can say that God has blessed you during this time? Raise your hands. You at home, I can't see your hands, but I know to cheer you on. I feel the same way. It's like... God has been good. He's kept his covenant with us. We tithe. We give him the 10%. We live off of 90%. You can give him more, but I wouldn't cheat him because I trust his word, and his word is true. And it gives us that covenant, that pipeline between God and, and us. And no matter what is going on in this economy, the economy is not our source. He's the one that breathes the breath of life in us, that we can go to work every day, that we can do that which we've been called to do. And so I've heard testimonies of some of you getting jobs and better jobs and raises and bonuses, gifts and surprises in the mail, and I'm thankful for that because that's God. Amen? Amen? That's God. Trust me. We talk to a lot of different pastors, a lot of different churches and all, and um, it's not that case all over. So we're not anything special. It's just... We put, you know, a lot of faith into what we teach and preach here, and we trust God, and he takes care of us, and he takes care of all his children, Amen. if you'll trust him and let him. Amen? Amen. So Exodus 14, 13 says, Moses answered, don't be afraid, stand your ground, and you will see what the Lord will do to save you today. You will never see these Egyptians again. Now, that's pretty strong, right? How many of you think they never wanted to see those Egyptians again? I do. It's like, get me out of here now. So it took faith for them to trust Moses, didn't it? A lot of faith at times. And even at times they rebelled against Moses later on. So, you know, we just have to keep trusting God sometimes because it can look the blackest before dawn, and that's really truth. I don't know if you've ever been in a position where you've had to... Trust God, and you know that God's the only one that's going to turn things around, and he can do it. Amen. Amen. You got testimony? You just praising the Lord with me? All right. He's just giving me a thumbs up, but it was the hands of Jesus. Okay. Um, God's so good. Pastor Mike and I have proven it over and over again. So I want to encourage you today. Stand on the Word of God. Trust the Word of God. Sow seed in the time of famine if you have to. Sow it into good ground. If you can't do something that, if you only have a little bit, it's not going to take care of the situation. Trust God and sow the seed into something or some ministry or somebody that you know could use it. And watch God. Just watch God. Because really, if the truth's known when you, when you teach on the seed of faith and the sowing and reaping, we're living today on the seed we sowed a long time ago. Right? You farmers, you gardeners know that, right? So if you're not quite where you want to be today, check out what seed you've been sowing. Amen? Okay, now let's say our confession. I believe you are the God of breakthrough. You, O oh Lord, orchestrate all the intended elements needed for breakthrough in my life, my relationships, and my finances. I position myself for miracles of breakthrough. Today I give with great expectation that the God of breakthrough is working for me. 
So, Father God, we thank you right now, and we seal off this time of worship and prayer, and we give you glory and honor for what you've been doing in our hearts and our lives. Thank you for health, for food on our table, that our families are healthy and whole. And, Father God, we thank you for protection during this time, and we thank you that we have eyes to see clearly and ears to hear clearly the Word of God, and we're not wrapped up in going down rabbit trails and conspiracy theories. We keep our eyes on you the author and finisher of our faith. In Jesus' precious name, amen. amen. So be it. Now, one more thing. I'm going to, uh, I wanted to pray for Beth and the babies. Are they in the quiet room or? She's sleeping? Okay, well, you want me to wait till after service maybe? Okay. All right, but let's pray for Beth. Is it okay if we just pray for you? Because she's going back to work today and you're in the medical field, right? Okay. Uh, this is Mary Young Grace's beautiful daughter-in-law who has blessed them with two lovely, beautiful grandchildren. So she will always be tops in their book. <laughs> but stretch your hands towards Beth, and let's just pray. Uh, she works in the medical field, and she's been off on maternity leave, and she's going back tonight, so a little extra prayer helps. Father God, we thank you for watching over Beth, and we thank you, Lord, for all those that are in the medical field, that you continue to move uh, mightily on them, to protect them, keep them. And Father, we just thank you that you bless she and her family, Eric, and the children, and continue to watch over them and keep them safe and whole in Jesus' precious name. And let her have an excellent time as she returns to work. Amen. Because we moms know that's hard, right, to go back to work and leave your babies. Okay, children's workers, you can go to the back. Wilma, I also wanted to offer our condolences. We were praying for you last week. I know you lost your sister, and um, my heart was heavy for you because that's, that's just so hard to not be able to be with family during this time. And I know you'd been right down there taken care of her to the end. So, Father, we just thank you for Wilma also. Continue to bless our sister, Lord, and comfort her. Give her peace and strength now. And all those, whether you're here in church with us or not, if you've lost loved ones during this time, if you've um, just not been able to be with your loved ones during uh, this time because of the virus, Lord, we just ask that you comfort and bring them peace and strength right now. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Okay, Pastor Mike. Well, another person that we need to congratulate, you know, it's, it's just been a strange year because of um, we've had people graduate and they can't have a graduation ceremony and parties and stuff like that. And we had, so um, Emily and Ethan graduated from high school and, and then we have Jeff who retired and he retired on a Wednesday and found out that someone he had come in contact with had uh, the COVID-19 and so he's been in quarantine for two weeks. So now today he is doubly free, free from work, free from work and free from quarantine. So uh, he's out and uh, you know, I, I was able to watch his um, um, retirement ceremony and it was just, it was, it was really good. It was, it was kind of, uh, Jeff said it was good except for the, uh, you didn't have all of the people there and and the food, I think, is what the, the thing you said. <laughs> Didn't have the food. So there's just a lot of things that were different. It was just he, but, I, you know, there was a one-star general, I guess it was, that came up and just talked about Jeff and how he'd worked with him, and it was just a really good ceremony. It was hard to hear some of the stuff because some of the people weren't even there. They were communicating through a computer. And so, um, you know, I, I know it's disappointing with those, some of those things, but know, Jeff, that you are loved, and we are proud of you. Yeah. And so thankful for you. I also talked with uh, two of our missionaries this week, or over the last 10 days, I guess it's been, and just to give you a quick update, I talked to Andy Clark. Um, Andy is, uh, lives in Virginia, and some of you probably don't know him. He's been here a couple of times, but um, he, he's had a varied uh, ministry. He, he goes to Africa and Haiti and different places and has a ministry base over there in those nations. And uh, he also has a big pre prison ministry in Virginia and Richmond. 
uh, having great success. But as, as he was sharing with me, that's been shut down, you know, because of the COVID um, virus and um, uh, his trips have been canceled. But he's been putting his time and effort into a radio broadcast uh, that's been broadcast into, um, this is not shortwave, this is actual radio stations that's been broadcast into, into Africa, especially in the Kenya area and those uh, Burundi and some of those other nations there. And uh, it's, it's very important because a lot of these people do not have, um, they're, they're restricted, and I'll talk about that in just a second, but they're, they're dealing with the same stuff that we're dealing with. So they're not able to travel, and most of these places do not have internet, and so they can get the radio. And so his ministry is going forth, and it's really doing well in ministering, so uh, Andy's doing a great job. And I also talked to Jonah this week, and uh, many of you know that uh, Jonah lost his wife um, when was that? Um, was it earlier this year or at the end of last year? But she was, they were involved in an automobile accident and his wife was killed. And, um, and he was supposed to be here this summer because this is the year that the missionaries come over to the worship center. But all of that travel was canceled. So hopefully we'll see him next year. But they've been shut down over there in Kenya as well. Uh, he was saying that uh, it's not been really, it's, it's worse in the cities than it is in the villages, but the problem is, is some of the people from the cities have gone out to the villages, and then that's a, a affected some people, but they're beginning to open up. He said that his church was opening this, this today. They've already had their service, I'm sure. And uh, so uh, things are, are, are happening there, and uh, he's been staying at home, and he said um, with his children, and he said nine of them, uh, in the home, and I think some of them, probably the, some of the family and extended family have come back to live with Jonah during this time, and, um, and so he uh, shared that uh, he's been watching our broadcast, so hi Jonah, and uh, enjoying it, and uh, wanted me to send his love and greetings to you all, and so yeah, we love you Jonah, and so hopefully we'll see him next year. I, I just, Jonah's been one of my favorite uh, people for a long time. My, my first uh, missionary trip as a pastor was to India and to Kenya and both of those places uh, I, I just have such a heart for both those places I, I, I just want to go back to India really bad and, and by Kenya I've been three or four times and if you don't recall we did build a church over there in Kenya and it's doing really well and uh, I just love the I love the the people but I, I love Jonah Jonah's just been such a um, he's, he's a fun guy I just love being around him. I love to hear him preach and he's just um one of my favorite people in the world. So uh, he'll be with us next year. So are you ready for the word this morning? S several weeks ago, I read from Isaiah chapter 43, which spoke of God doing a new thing. And I just want to read that scripture very quickly. But in, in verse 18, do not remember the former things, nor consider the things of old. Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth. Shall you not know it? I will even make a road in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. And I, and I share with you that uh, scripture in, to encourage us concerning what I believe our call in the crisis is, and that is to allow the rivers of God to flow out of us into the barren places and the wilderness that's all around us. And so this morning, I want to build on that theme by looking at a very familiar character in the Bible. And... Uh, our main text this morning will be John chapter 1, if you want to turn there. But Father, thank you for your presence today. Thank you for your heart for us. And I just thank you for your anointing to minister the word and, and, and each of us to hear it. God, help me to share what you've placed in my heart. Let, it, let me be able to share it with boldness and clarity. These things that have been in my head and I've been thinking about and praying about in my spirit. I just thank you that you're going to help me to communicate these to the people today. And will we receive that in Jesus' name? Amen. Other than the principal characters in the, involved in the ministry and crucifixion of Jesus, like the disciples and the mother of Jesus and the, the Roman rulers and the, the priests, this is one of the characters, few characters that's mentioned in all four of the Gospels. John the Baptist makes his appearance some 400 years after the prophet Malachi. So after Malachi, there was 400 years of, of silence. And during that time, there was no prophet speaking to Israel about, uh, uh, about their repentance or their present condition or their future promise. 
And we know that Jesus was born in a manger in Bethlehem, but few people knew of the birth. So it didn't really, just the birth of Jesus didn't affect the nation at that point. You know, he was born, uh, we had the star, the wise men, the shepherds, uh, even Herod and, and the massacre of the, of the children. Uh, but when that kind of died down, you know, there was about 18 years where you didn't hear anything about Jesus. Uh, we, we, mentioned, we hear him mentioned in, when he was 12 years old and he went to the temple. So for about 30 years after the birth, uh, there wasn't much that was going on. So 400 years after the prophet Malachi and 30 years after the birth of Jesus, uh, this man appears out of nowhere and he begins to preach. And so first we have to determine who John was. And we're going to be looking at all of the four Gospels, as I said this morning, but primarily John chapter 1. And in verse 6, it begins by saying, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. And this man came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. And it's interesting that... John mentions him. When you, when you see the name John in the, in the book of John, John is not talking about himself because when John talked about himself, John said he was the one that Jesus loved. He described himself as that. And the other thing was he always pointed out that he was the one that beat Peter to the tomb in the race, okay? So John always just kind of comes around from the side to explain who he was by giving these descriptions. I'm, I'm the Lord's beloved, and I beat Peter in a race, you know, so he never let Peter live that down. So when you hear him talk about John, we know he's talking about the man named, known as John the Baptist. So the apostle John makes it clear that John the Baptist was not the Messiah, but he was the one going to bear witness of the light. And the Message Bible says he was there to show the way to the light, the Passion Translation says he came to show who is, for he was merely a messenger to speak the truth about the light. The New Living Translation says to tell them about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. So that was his purpose. He was to bear witness of the light. So John begins to preach and he attracts a crowd. In Matthew chapter 3, verses 5 and 6, it says, Then Jerusalem, all Judea, all the regions around the Jordan went out to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan, confessing their sins. So, I mean, think about it. How many people did John, John's ministry affect? I tried to determine how many people were in Jerusalem at the time of Jesus. And I got many d different scholars and different things that I were reading were giving me many different uh, population counts. It went from anywhere from 80,000 people to over a million. Now, I think a million is a lot, you know, when you're thinking about times back then. But it wasn't just the people in Jerusalem, but it says all Judea and the region around the Jordan went out to him. So there was at least tens of thousands of people around there. So we know that when John was preaching, there was a huge crowd that was following him and he was making an impact. And he was very highly esteemed by the people, including Herod the king. If you remember... When Herod had him arrested for preaching about the fact that Herod took his own brother's sister as a wife, he was afraid to do anything to John because he knew how much the people had respect for, you know, how much they esteemed John. And so he, he was afraid to do anything about him. Now, when the angel prophesied to Zechariah and Elizabeth, who was his father and mother, that they were going to be parents of, of John, the angel declared that in Luke 1.17, he will also go before him in the spirit and the power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. This means that he was going to, he wasn't Elijah reincarnated, okay? Uh, but he was going to resemble Elijah in, the, in his, for one thing, his simple way of life. You know, it describes uh, uh, um, John as, you know, camel's hair and, you know, eating locusts, living out in the, in the desert. So he had this simple life. And, and also the way that he reproved even the kings, the way that he preached. Elijah was, Elijah was very bold when he preached. He, he went to Ahab and talked to Ahab. There's going to be, there's going to be a drought. You know, he, he, he stood in, in front of the king and challenged him. So, and we know that John challenged Herod as well. But there was another description of John that was voiced by the prophets in the Old Testament that we find in each of the Gospels. Now, before we get to that, I, I want us to understand that 
John is called John the Baptist, not because he was a Baptist. He wasn't part of that denomination. He wasn't the founder of the Baptist denomination, but he was called John the Baptist because he baptized people, all right? So it would be more correct to call him John the Baptizer, all right? So just for clarification. So we're talking about John the Baptizer. And in John chapter 1, again, verse 19, it says, Now this is the testimony of John. When the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who are you? He confessed and did not deny, but confessed, I am not the Christ. All right, so he quickly tells everybody he's not the Christ. He's not the Messiah that they've been looking for. Verse 21, And they ask him, What then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? And he answered, No. Now, it's interesting that John says, nope, I'm not Elijah. Well, all of these other people were prophesying that he was coming in the spirit of Elijah. And um, even Jesus himself in Matthew chapter 11, verses 13 and 14 says, for all of the prophets in the law pr prophesied until John. And if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. So why did John say he wasn't Elijah? You know, I'm not sure, but maybe John was just messing with them a little bit, you know, uh, uh, maybe because he thought, well, uh, you know, I, I guess I'm Elijah kind of in ministry, but I'm not Elijah in the body. I'm still John. Or it could be that he really didn't know the fullness of his call in life. I, I don't know. I mean, you know, he, he knew what he was called to do and he was doing it. But maybe he was not convinced that he was, in fact, that Elijah that God proclaimed would come. He was just doing his job. He wasn't out to try to get disciples for himself. He wasn't making a ministry for himself. He was preparing the way for the Lord. And that was his call. So John, uh, in verse 22, then it's, uh, they said to him, Who are you? That we may give an answer to those who sent us. What do you say about yourself? And he said... I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make straight the way of the Lord, as the prophet Isaiah said. So John calls himself what the other gospels had called him, and that is a voice in the wilderness. And in doing so, he identifies himself with a prophet, and the prophet wasn't Elijah, but the prophet was actually Isaiah that he identified himself with. And he quotes from Isaiah chapter 40. Now, I really think it's, it's um, significant that he identifies with Isaiah and, and with the prophet Isaiah. You know, the book of Isaiah is, is very interesting. It, it has significant structure. In fact, some people call the book Isaiah, of Isaiah the mini Bible within the Bible, right? Um, I, I have shared with you before that I believe that every scripture that's in the Bible was God-breathed. It was inspired by God. But the chapter and verse divisions are not necessarily inspired by God. You know, God breathed his word, but he didn't say, okay, this is going to be verse 18, and this is going to be verse 19. All right, some uh, scholar did that years ago and, and divided it all up. And that's important to know that it's not necessarily God-breathed because there are things that we're reading in a chapter and you can come to the end of that chapter and think the thought is closed. But then if you go to the first verse of the next chapter, you see the thought is, going, is continuing. So when we study the Bible, you have to realize that the Bible was written like a letter, especially the epistles in the New Testament. And so, you know, I, they didn't write letters and chapters and verses. They wrote the whole letter. And sometimes it's the best thing to do is if you're studying the book of Philippians is just read Philippians 1 through 4 in one setting to get the full meaning of everything that's there. So the, the chapter divisions and verse divisions are not necessarily inspired, but I, I really believe that Isaiah is, at least the chapter divisions, because the book of Isaiah has 66 chapters and the Bible has 66 books. There are 39 Old Testament books. There are 27 New Testament books. And so what is interesting is that in the chapters leading up to and including chapter 39, these chapters are talking about warning and judgment, and they're preparing the people of Israel to be conquered and taken into captivity by Assyria and Babylon, which did happen in 722 B.C. and 586 B.C., 
But then in chapter 40, Isaiah makes a dramatic shift and he stops the words of judgment and he starts to give words of hope and comfort for the people of Babylon. It's almost as if you're starting to read a new book. And really, I believe between 39 and 40, we're moving from the Old Testament into the New Testament. And in that break, we're moving from words of judgment to words of hope. And those words of hope, those words of comfort begin by saying this in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God, Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So you can see here the context of Isaiah was the hope of exiles returning from Assyria and Babylon. But the context of Israel is a foreshadow of the ministry of John the Baptist. So during the days of John the Baptist, the Israelites were not in physical exile, but they were in spiritual exile. But make no mistake, you know, that there, was, there was this challenge that was going on. So they were not, they were back in their land, but spiritually they were in exile. They, they lived in the land of Abraham, but they lacked the faith of Abraham. So that was the challenge that we saw there. So there's hope and comfort being preached, even though it is coming forth extremely strong from the voice of John the Baptist, because he was taking no prisoners with his preaching because he realized that the only way a person can truly be comforted is if they turn their hearts complete toward God and live lives that are pleasing to him. So before we get to the main thing that I want to talk about this morning, I want to expound on the description that John uses of his ministry and purpose. So John declared his purpose was to, in Luke chapter 3, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. So he's really uh, declaring what Isaiah declared. And really the people, when when we would have heard something like that, maybe we would have thought, what's he talking about? But the people at that time would have understand what he meant by those things that he was saying. The idea is taken from the practice of Eastern monarchs who when they were moving into a country or visiting a country, they didn't want to be bothered by mountains and valleys and all of those kind of things. They wanted a smooth journey. They wanted to get there and do what they were going to do and then get back. So they would send people out in front of them And they would actually work to lower the mountains and to fill up the valleys so that when they traveled, they would travel on a smooth way and and not a bunch of curvy things and up and down and, and, you know, all of that. They would just be able to go from one place, from his kingdom to that kingdom without a problem. And so the people of Israel had had seen that happen. They'd experienced that. So they knew what what was being done. So this gives them a word picture of the purpose of John's ministry. So John was telling the people, look, the king is coming, the Messiah is coming, and there needs to be preparation done in order to receive him. Is everybody with me? So the writers of the gospel, and even John the baptizer himself, calls him a voice in the wilderness. And that's what I want to focus on this morning and the rest of our time together. The wilderness that John was talking about was not a physical place. It was a spiritual reality. When you think about who John was ministering to at that time and where John was, the wilderness at that time consisted of an anti-one true God government. The Romans that were ruling were a pagan nation believing in many false gods, and they were indulging in many divergent lifestyles. They were not only resistant to the Jewish faith, but later on they persecuted the newly formed church and tried to stop its influence, right? So that's government. 
The Jewish church was also the wilderness to which John was sent to announce the coming of the Messiah because it's interesting that when the Pharisees and the Sadducees came out to see John preach, he just looked at them and said, you brood of vipers. He said, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? You know, they, the Jews had strayed from their faith in God. Through all of the additional laws and statutes that they had instituted, they were teaching a false religion, not the one that God had intended. So really, the Jewish faith had become corrupt and compromised. So John was the voice in the wilderness telling the people that they needed to repent and change their ways. He was preaching to a wilderness that was missing the presence of God. And, and really, when, when I was thinking about this, I think his act of baptizing the people was really twofold. Because we understand when we're baptized that baptism itself is an, an outward expression of an inward transformation. Yes. Baptizing somebody doesn't save them. All right? That person has accepted Jesus Christ and they go to the pool, they go to the river, wherever it is, and they are put under the water, which represents them being buried with Christ. They are pulled up out of the water, which represents them being alive with that new life in Christ. So it's a representation of something that's already happened on the inside. So that's the first aspect of it. But the second aspect of it, I believe, is that it was baptizing a life that was up to that point dry and barren into the river of God's presence. So they were taking this dry, barren person that had been so far away from God and they were putting them in the river of God. And so that opened them up to the presence of God in a new way. And I believe that God's call upon the church is the same as his call upon John the baptizer. The true church of God, the true believer, each one of us in this room today is called to be a voice crying in the wilderness. Because we are dealing with the same type of wilderness today. First, we have a wilderness political scene. We can see this anti-one true God mindset that's most evident in the radical left that's trying to take over this country. And they're pushing every divergent lifestyle and promoting policies that will destroy this nation morally and financially. If the left has their way, we will be a socialist nation and there will be a major war against the church to try to silence her. Part of the restrictions on churches now, I believe, is an, is an attempt of the enemy to silence the church. Don't yeah. sing, don't chant, don't do whatever you do in religious service. Keep your mouth shut. You can go and sit in a chair. I even heard that um, they're, they're challenging churches in, in New York City that are planning on meeting despite the mayors telling them not to, and he's threatening to bulldoze them down. And we're also, so we're dealing with that political side of things, just like John was with the Romans, and we're dealing with a compromised church because the church is yielding to modern culture norms. They're allowing cultural dictates to override biblical principles. So we're in the same wilderness as John was. So we are called to be a voice in the wilderness. And there are a couple of things I wanted to see about being a voice. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So the first word that John shared is the word repent. So, number one, we are to be a voice that cries out for repentance. The first call of the kingdom is to Repentance. Biblical repentance really involves three things. First of all, it involves renunciation and reversal. There is no birth into the kingdom without hearing the call to salvation, renouncing one's sin, turning from sin toward Jesus the Savior. So repentance is a change of mind that dictates a change of actions. It means walking one direction and then turning and walking in a different direction. So there is a definite and noticeable change that takes place in a person's life. I really believe if someone says, I, I accepted Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior, 
there, there needs to be something that indicates on the outside that indicates that that happened on the inside. It may take a little bit of time, but they're striving for that. If their lifestyle over a period of years doesn't change, then I wonder, did they really? Okay? Second thing it involves is submission and teachability. There is no growth in the kingdom without obedience to Jesus' commandments and a childlike response in it as a disciple of Jesus, yielding to the teaching of God's word. So repentance means we submit ourselves to God and we build our lives on his word. And the third thing it means is continual shapeability. And there is a, a, no lifelong, a lifelong increase of fruit as a citizen of the kingdom without a willingness to accept the Holy Spirit's correction and guidance. So the Holy Spirit lives inside of us to direct us and correct us and help us make those adjustments so that we can follow the Lord more fully. So repentance is a decision that results in a change of mind, which in turn leads to a change of purpose and action. And when true repentance is preached and men turn from sin... God, in turn, places a new understanding of things in their hearts. So this message of true repentance, when accepted, has with it the possibility of mending things. And we know that when the church was established, they immediately mended the, the, the differences between Jew and Samaritan and the Jew and Gentile because God wants to bring reconciliation. He wants to, to heal those hurts. So just as God had a voice some 2,000 years ago that prepared people for, for the coming of Jesus in that day, so God will have a people today that's going to preach his message, preparing the people for the Lord's next return. And it's the only message that can truly bring about the change that's needed in this wilderness of today. So the first one is repentance. Second, we are to be a voice that is kingdom down, not culture up. John declared, repent and the reason to repent is that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. In the New Testament, it records 137 references to the kingdom, and over 100 of these are during Jesus' ministry. So his entire teaching and approach as the Messiah, the Savior King, centered on the thing about the kingdom of God being in hand. So what's the kingdom referring to? Well, the kingdom is where the king is and where the king rules. So John was telling the people that Jesus was not only coming, but he was near, and that they needed to look for him. So Jesus, the king, came. He destroyed the power of Satan over people's lives uh, to those that would turn to Jesus. And even though Jesus is no longer here in the flesh, his kingdom is still here, and we're part of his kingdom. And I believe our call is to see his kingdom established in our lives, but also in the lives of others and wherever we have influence. When the disciples asked Jesus, they said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. Jesus began what, what we familiarly know as the Lord's Prayer, but it really isn't the Lord's Prayer. It's the disciples' prayer. It's our prayer. And so in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, he said, In this manner, therefore, pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we should be praying for God's kingdom to come. We should work to see that what is in God's will in heaven is God's will on earth. We should be working toward that. So everything that we say and do should be kingdom down, not culture up. Are you with me? So the kingdom of heaven is in stark contrast to the kingdom of the earth that's expressed in culture. What we should be sharing and establishing sh should be based on the unchanging, unwavering principles of the kingdom of God expressed in the word of God and not based on the constantly shifting morals of culture. So a voice in the wilderness is a voice that declares the kingdom of God. The next one is important. We are to be a voice, not an echo. Now let me explain that. We should not be an echo of culture. Some Christians know more about the icons and productions of the world than they do about the scripture. Amen. They can recite quotes from movies, but they can't recite a verse from the Bible. Come on. I'm not saying that we can't enjoy movies and sports and those kind of things. We can. But I am saying that your primary feeding has to be from the Word of God if you're going to fulfill the purpose of God in your life. 
you have to give priority in your life to the things of God. All right? Because what you put in you is what's going to come out of you. Culture is not going to help you through the struggles of life. Some movie quote from a movie is not going to make you victorious in life. It's the word of God. It's the presence of God. So that's what we need to be feeding on. We also don't want to be an echo of preachers or other spiritual people. I don't want you to echo me. I want you to know the word of God for yourself and not just repeat the clip notes from my sermon. All right. We don't want to just repeat what we've heard someone else say or a revelation that someone else has. For our voice to have meaning, what we say must come from our hearts, not our heads. It comes out of hearing and applying, not just hearing. A voice from the heart, not the head. At the beginning of becoming a pastor, I found out it wasn't enough to believe something because of what I grew up with. And that was what my church believed and practiced, so that's what we do, right? I I never questioned those things because that was just the way things were, all right? But when people began to challenge me about things, then I knew I, had, I could no longer be an echo about that thing. I had to be a voice about it. I had to know why I believed what I believe. Right. And obviously the first thing was women in ministry. We got hit by that by a couple of strong guys right away. They wanted to challenge me in that way. Shut your wife up. And so I grew up in churches. I didn't have a woman pastor, but there were women evangelists that came in all the time. Women did stuff in the church, and it was like, okay. So what I had to do then was I had to go to the Word, and I had to find out what the Word said. Because what the Word says is what makes it true. And so I, I, based, I, I no longer became an echo in that area, but I became a voice because I support women in ministry, and I believe the Bible teaches that. Right? But if you don't have a foundation about something, all you are is an echo. You're not a voice. Does that make sense? And that works that way for everything that we believe, especially a crazy prophetic church like us, because there's always someone that's going to challenge what we do. The only echo we should desire is the reverberation, the response of our voice and our worship as it impacts our, impl- our places of influence. We, what we want to do, our worship, we want it to reverberate in every place that we go. We, we want that to come back to us. And number four, the last one, we are to be a voice of experience, not just book knowledge. When, when you think about choosing a vocation, to understand what that profession is truly like, uh, you don't want to go to somebody that's learning about the profession. You want to go to somebody that's been in that profession a long time. I don't know if Dr. Mike did this when he, when he decided to become a dentist. I don't know if he had actually talked to a dentist and said, what is a dentist's life like? What is the work you do every day? What is it like so I really know if I want to do this or not? You know, if you want to join the military, uh, you, you want to talk to someone like Jeff who's made a career out of the military. Is this really for me or not? Whatever your vocation may be, you want to talk to somebody who's been there and done that just so that you know whether that's something you want. If I was to ask somebody about pastoring, what pastoring is like, I would not ask a recent graduate of seminary. I would ask somebody that's been a pastor for a long, long time. What is this pastoring thing? What, what is it like? I remember, you know, because they know the joys and the struggles of, of, of pastoring. I remember when Pastor Don Habersack came, first came to me and shared that he felt God was calling him to be a pastor. And he said, what should I do? And I said, you should run from it as long as you can. <laughs> and when you can't run anymore, then become a pastor. Now, I don't know how spiritual that was, but I honestly told him that. And the reason why I told him that was because over the years I've seen guys, you know, they're like, oh, I'm going to be a pastor because they think it's some glamorous position. And so they start a church and as soon as something gets hard, they quit. 
And then you have people that are hurt. And when you know it's a true call of God, no matter what goes on in the struggles, and there are a bunch of them, you know down deep in your heart you can't quit because that's your call. And so I wanted Don to be sure of that. I, I, I know, you know, when I said run, I meant to really wait to make sure. No, I meant run, all right? <laughs> you know, when you think about it, seminary gives you a strong theological background. But it does not train you for pastoring and working with people. People coming out of seminary have a degree, they know the word, but they have no clue what they're getting into. And uh, those are two different things. Preparation for ministry, I believe, should be a combination of seminary and ministry school. And I have been to both. And what I've seen is that, uh, that seminary gives you a great theological foundation and ministry school teaches you how to use your gifts and minister to people. And I, I see the value of both of those things. But we are more effective in ministering to someone if we've been through what they're going through. And that's why when you go through something, realize that God wants to use what you went through as a platform for ministry to other people. You didn't go through that just so you could survive and then go on back to normal life. You went through it because there's going to be people that are going to come across your path that are going through the same thing, and you're going to be able to speak out of the voice of experience and say, look, this is how you make it through. We have each experienced the love and the forgiveness of God, and we have experienced and are still experiencing the transformation that takes place when we surrender our lives to Jesus. We are not just reciting something that we read about the love of Jesus. We're talking from the voice of experience. I have experienced the love of Jesus. I have experienced the arms of the Father around me. I have experienced making mistakes and feeling so far away from God and then God just running to meet me and throwing his arms around me and pulling me in and saying, you're my child. You've experienced that. You can share that with people. It's not just some words that you're sharing, some poem that you heard somebody say. It's not something that you heard a preacher say, but it's something that comes from the depths of your heart because you've experienced it. The wilderness around us needs to experience what we've experienced. Your testimony is a main sound that gives our voice meaning. So when you think about it, our roles are not much different than John the baptizer's. As God chose him, he's choosing us. Philippians, or 1 Peter 2, 9, But you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellency, the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. That's your call. Amen. That's your call. Our eyes have been opened to see that Christ is, in fact, the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. There's no other way to deal with sin Accept the blood of Jesus and we have to stand in the midst of a wilderness God has placed us in and cry out to the people behold the Lamb of God behold Jesus your Savior you know the Christian life is not about temples and church buildings it's about the testimony of the light of Jesus Christ and that was John's calling that was John's purpose to point people to Jesus our comfort our Prince of Peace the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world so no matter how popular he was, his mission didn't change. He was merely a voice crying out. He was not the light, and he knew it, and he embraced it, and he proclaimed it. Think about this. John the Baptist had thousands and thousands of followers. 2,000 years later, he has none. Jesus. when he died, had 120 followers that were in the upper room that day. 2,000 years later, 2.2 billion people claimed to follow Jesus, besides all of those that died in faith. You are to be a voice that cries out in the wilderness. You're to be a voice in the community that you live in. Your wilderness is the place that you work. Your wilderness is the place uh, or, that, that's around you, the community you live in. Your wilderness is your family and your friends. All around us is wilderness that needs to be touched by the love of Jesus. And you are the voice that God is sending, so be the voice that cries out 
to repent. Be that voice that cries out that the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Be a voice, not an echo. And be a voice that flows out of, of experiencing the great love and the grace and the mercy of Jesus. You are a voice crying in the wilderness. Can you receive that this morning? Amen. Just stand with me. Okay. I'm commissioning each one of us to be a voice this morning based on the word of God. So Father, I just, in the name of Jesus, this is your call upon us to be a voice in the wilderness. God, we see the dry places, the wilderness, the, the things that are around us. And God, you want us to, to declare your name and your kingdom in the midst of the darkness. And we thank you that we're not the light, but you are, and you live inside of us, and you said that we're to be light, and we're to be salt, and we're light because the light of the world lives inside of us. And so, God, we just shine today, and I just commission the people right now in the name of Jesus to be voices in the wilderness, and we thank you for your anointing upon us to do that. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you.